I'm Dr. Lou Tomswittle. I'm Clinical Regional Lead for Maritime Health Partnership in the College Practice, so I work over both Medway and Maidstone. I trained as a um, doctor at Bristol University. It was a really good training for me as a person and really suited my personality. It's very mixed training, has a lot of uh, ethics, biopsychosocial model. They get in primary care quite early within the syllabus. So I then did my F1, F2 in Swindon um, and in my F2 year I got to do a GP placement um, which I really enjoyed. Enjoyed the sort of diversity in terms of you're not stuck to one speciality and also diversity in terms of age, seeing the whole population um, and you get to see different types of populations as well. So I then got a training place at Guys and Tommy's um, to do my BTS um, and again had a really good, tra you know, good and interesting training placement, got to do paediatrics, sexual health, um, community gynae, got a good amount of GP placements as well and urgent treatment centre as well I got to work in um, for six months at St Thomas's and when I qualified I went and worked in Thamesmead um, which is uh, South East London and then my partner and I wanted to move out of London my partner was pregnant with our son and we wanted to go somewhere slightly more rural and with a bigger house and a garden <laughs> which we couldn't get in London moved to Medway worked in West Kent and um, but I was offered the role of clinical lead on Sheppey uh, one of the surgeries on Sheppey um, so I went to work for, uh, in Sheppey for four years and that practice in the end was um, dispersed. I stayed with the company for a little while um, but then Maritime approached me to come and work here. I really wanted to sort of move back to work in Medway and, and the, this is the area that I'd got to know um, with the population that I've got to know. I am a fellow in, uh, in gender dysphoria. The preferred term is, is now gender incongruence. So yeah, I'm a fellow, fellow in gender incongruence. I've had an interest in LGBTQ plus health inequalities or inequities um, for a number of years now. Uh, sort of started when I was working in London. I did a couple of workshops for medical students at King's College uh, Medical School in LGBTQ plus health inequities. And then when I moved down to work in, in Kent, I saw an increase in the number of trans people that were coming to the surgery um, for referral and support. In particular, number of under 18s um, that were approaching the surgery. And I thought, I don't, I don't know enough about, about this. I didn't know sort of the rules and regulations around the paperwork, the referrals, the local support services. So I reached out to the BU project, which is one of the main charities providing LGBTQ plus youth uh, sort of groups and support services over the whole of Kent and also to Swale Pride. I had meetings with them um, to see what we could do in our surgery to make it more LGBTQ plus friendly. I've got my own lived experience, but I wanted to have outside influences as well. So we, we worked on that. I developed a training for my staff within the surgery um, to, to look at yeah, how we could make ourselves more approachable, more friendly, looking at things like pronouns, preferred names, and I was sort of teaching myself as I went along. Last year, the Gender Incongruence Fellowship came up and I was like, oh, <laughs> it's amazing. Um, and so, yeah, applied, thankfully got, got it. And so I've been sort of working on similar things, but on a, on a bigger scale. So one of the things we're looking to roll out is training for the whole of the PCN that is hosting uh, the fellowship. That training will be quite basic to start with to make sure we're covering all the basics. So particularly looking at sort of terminology um, that trans people may use. So it because it's gender incongruence fellowship, it, it is trans focused rather than all LGBTQ+, but a lot of the um, things I will be covering cover the whole community um, and I may, you know, I'm happy to answer questions on things like fertility in same-sex couples or other health inequities that the whole community face. 
but the, the training was sort of looking at terminology uh, around, around the trans community, what are the barriers to healthcare, of which there are a number. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a population that suffers a lot of minority stress. So there's lots of, lots of stigma, there's a lot of health inequities in terms of five year wait at least to um, have an appointment in secondary care for those wishing to access hormones or surgery. There's a lot of uh, confusion and misunderstanding among healthcare staff about when you can change somebody's notes. Am I allowed to change their name? Am I allowed to change their gender? Am I allowed to put their preferred pronouns? A lot of people may not even know about preferred pro pronouns or preferred names and what those mean. So the training will cover all those um, and sort of when you can change paperwork, um, which basically there are, aren't actually set rules about, but a lot of people believe that you have to have a deed poll or a gender recognition certificate, which isn't actually the case. I'll also be looking at organ specific screening. Um, the trans community is often missed by our normal recall systems. So it's making sure making sure that surgeries have things in place um, to, to capture people that fall, fall outside the normal recall systems. Also be looking at how can we make our surgeries more LGBTQ plus friendly, so having more inclusive registration forms, having more inclusive toilets, for example, if possible, can the surgery have a gender neutral toilet, having a more inclusive waiting room you know, can we have more posters that represent minorities on the walls? Um, so training will be looking at things like that and also talking about charities that are available locally and nationally uh, to support people as well. So I mentioned BU Project, but there's also MGSD in Medway who produced a lot of their own training and done a lot of work with the sexual health services and surveys around um, barriers to healthcare in, in the local area. Yeah, so again, um, actually organ specific screening. So it's a big one. A lot of sort of cisgender women who identify as lesbian, there was sort of a lot of talk in the past that they didn't need uh, cervical screening, but actually that's not true. Um, so, you know, when you go back, you know, sort of 80s, 90s, um, it was thought if you never had sort of intercourse with a man um, that you didn't need cervical screening. So the, the, the rates of mm. cervical screening uptake, or it always used to be, I don't, I don't know the current figures, but it always used to be that they were lower due again to sort of stigma and, and discrimination in, in society in general. There's generally high rates of um, mental health problems, drug and alcohol use, domestic abuse, rates can be quite high. Loneliness as well, a lot of um, the older sort of LGB uh, community, a lot of them were alive when homosexuality was still illegal mm. and you know to be in a relationship risked imprisonment. So a lot of the older population are sort of still quite isolated, um, may find it hard to access healthcare, it can be a scary place, it can be a worrying place um, to sort of be open about your sexuality or your gender um, based on sort of historical experiences, even if it's not current experiences. So people don't necessarily access healthcare when they should. There's also things like fertility um, treatments if you're in a same sex relationship. Um, the rules vary slightly, ICB to ICB, but you have to have a large number of tries through a private clinic before you can access IVF on, on the NHS, somewhere between six and 12 goes, and each go can cost two grand. You know, that can be a massive outlay for same-sex couples looking to start, to start a family. And as, as a member of the community, Pride Month means everything to me. I can remember going to my first Pride in London and I'm still getting goosebumps <laughs> about it. That acceptance and seeing other people around me who are like me. You don't have to come out repeatedly and I think that some, somebody who's not of the community may not fully understand that, but every time 
I talk about my children, for example, it often comes out, oh, well, actually, I, I didn't give birth to my son. Um, my daughter's adopted. That's how we created a family. Or every time I talk about my wife, I'm essentially having to come out and you don't know what somebody's reaction is going to be. I also identify under the trans umbrella. And again, you know, if you're trying to explain your pronouns or whereas if you're in a queer space, it's something that just happens naturally. Hi, I'm Lou, my pronouns are she, they. And then the next person goes and nobody asks what is a pronoun or, you know, how did you come by your family or why are you wearing that? Or it, it's just accepted you don't, those kind of minority stressors are much reduced. And I don't think we necessarily celebrate Pride Month enough in primary care. And I would like to see it celebrated more, you know, taking it as an opportunity to promote areas where there are health inequities. You know, could we use it to get our um, cervical screening done for our, our le lesbian population or our trans population or our non-binary population or take that time to have a special service for that? Um, those people that may find it harder to come for their smear or looking at all the other health inequities. It is things like coming into a surgery and not seeing yourself represented in that surgery or worried that people might give you odd looks about the way that you dress or who you come into the surgery with. Um, so putting things like posters up on the wall. There, there has been a lot of research done, particularly by the LGBT um, Foundation, the impact of posters that are representative of the LGBTQ plus community can have on the waiting rooms and, and people entering them.